And we are live uh, now, not in uh, 23 hours and 59 no, minutes. I, I was, don't know what that was I was, was just saying. about to get up and walk away and be like, I don't have to come back for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So close. Anyway, <laughs> I'm David. And I'm Justin. And together we are the leads on game development and design here at Codename. And we also founded Codename, so we've got that going for us as well. And we're going to be your hosts for this episode and for every episode. Uh, because when we're not here, the show doesn't happen. Still true. Uh, today is our 44th episode. And it's going to be our 44th best episode ever. Wait, doesn't that mean it's going to be our worst episode? Mm, uh, no. No, it's our 44th best episode in a row. I'm not really sure I follow that. Okay, well, it's like Mythbusters. You watched Mythbusters, right? Well, every explosion on Mythbusters was Adam's favorite explosion. It's like that, but episodes. Are you comparing us to the Mythbusters, the, the legendary Mythbusters? I mean, I guess I've been comparing Idle Champions to Dark Souls a lot lately, so mm, I'll allow it. I mean, as far as comparisons go, there were two of them, there's two of us. They had myths, we have myths. Like the myth of a bug-free event launch. Oh, Anyway, uh, we are here to answer development and design questions about idle champions. And if you don't ask any questions, however, you may have to suffer through Justin's one-man reenactment of Season 2, Episode 5 of Mythbusters. He's with the obsession with Mythbusters this week. Let me see. What was that episode? Buried alive? No, 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 no. I don't think so. Come on. It'll be fun. No, hard pass. Questions, please. <sighs> Fine, I'll cancel the dump truck. Anyway, as always, we have pulled some questions from the previous show that we did not get to, and we will answer some of those while we are waiting for new questions to come in, as well as we have a few updates from items that we had flagged to get looked at by the dev team. So let's get looking at those. Let me find the tab. <laughs> All right. So I didn't get a full list from Peter today. Um, for various reasons, one being that I didn't ask him in time and the other being that there's a bit of a fire in one of the builds. So um, main fix that is going out, not, uh, at the, not at this very moment, but very shortly, um, is some loading performance issues or fixes that uh, Jacob and myself have been working on over the last week, which in general should make uh, graphic loading in the game not only faster, but no longer cause any kind of uh, hiccups or frame losses when uh, when multiples are loaded at the same time. So that's coming very soon to uh, to Steam and to Epic, and then the other platforms shortly thereafter. Uh, so that should be a good fix. And then ongoing, um, looks like <laughs> I'm still supposed to be bugging Justin about the missing node on the strong core. Uh, we would like to have the Havilar imps automatically spawn and uh, having feats save in with formations. Now, let's get on to some questions that were left over from the previous show. Let's do it, yeah. Uh, the first question here from last week's show, or the second show of last week's, I should say, uh, is uh, from Dirty Toes B, who asked, could you please add a section to time gates that lets you know how many champion variants are left to be completed for each champion, please? You know, uh, there's hmm. a lot of requests on the additional data that's shown on the time gates. I feel like we need almost like a, an additional window or dialogue hover over on each of the champions when you look at them just to actually see, you know, A, how many variants are left, B, you know, what, what the next uh, chest uh, epic timer is. Um, we should just replace the entire dialogue with just a spreadsheet, just a table of data. And I'm okay with that. Champion, number of variants left, uh, number of chests towards uh, guaranteed epic, and then like, go. Yeah. I mean, I think though, seriously. From the yeah, question. no, seriously, I, I do think it's a good uh, a good suggestion. Uh, I, I joke, but I think it's a good suggestion. Right up there, alongside uh, being able to show golden or uh, time into the yeah, epic pity timer. Let's say that. <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be kind of interesting if we could take that data and sort of roll it into like a how complete is this champion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Hmm. That's a good suggestion. All right, next question here uh, was from Dota Two Norax asking, can we get a Modron piece that crosses two pipes without mixing the flows? And related, have you been able to get 500% overflow on all nodes in any core? 
Um, yeah, so I think we've gotten that suggestion for that kind of pipe before. We've also gotten the suggestion for two that kind of curve in, uh, a curve uh, without uh, merging as well. Um, I think those are interesting ideas for pieces. We don't have any immediate plans to do sort of new pieces like that, but I think it's uh, it's a good thing to hold in our back pocket uh, if down the road we want to make uh, that Modron uh, uh, system a little bit more interesting and, and a little bit more variability and, uh, and, and nuance to it. So yeah, I mean, I think that's a really cool idea. Um, as for your related question about being able to get 500% overflow in all nodes of any core, I was able during my testing to get over to, to basically supercharge every single core, which is a thousand, um, uh, a thousand flow in each core. I have not been able to get uh, the full overflow, which is you know however many millions or, or billions of flow to every single node in uh, any of the existing cores. I am thinking that some of the ones that we've kind of designed might have the ability to do that because really it's just a function of. Uh, how much open space there is in the core because you the way you get your your flow up really really quickly is by splitting the flow and then putting it back together and splitting it and putting it back together and splitting it and putting it back together and the more times you can do that is really a function um but the number of times you can do that is really a function of the amount of open space in the core so there are some some cores coming up that have uh, quite a bit of open space more open space than some of the existing ones so it might be possible in the future uh or it might just be um uh, forgive me a pipe dream boo wow see i was going to give you a hard time for suggesting you keep that piece in your back pocket <laughs> seems uncomfortable but yeah well i just i, I have a standing desk you uh never use let's it, see <laughs> <laughs> yeah but if i had something in my back pocket i could <laughs> Uh, next question is from Insomniac68 uh, from last week's episode, and they say uh, it can be quite tedious adding various potions to a party every time you start a new run. Any thoughts into a few programmable potion preset button options that would let you add a specific set of potions all at once? Hmm. Programmable potion presets. It alliterates. I like it. <laughs> I do like. I think this like part of part of this is kind of handled by like Modrons can technically do this. They have the ability to set uh, the the potions that you want to use at a certain level. There are definitely some limitations of that. I mean, it just happens every time you start a new run or when you get to the uh, the areas in a run, um, rather than it being something you can kind of toggle yourself. So you could have it use the uh, the the potions when you didn't necessarily want them to if you're on like a, a quick one run and you've got that core active but there are some options there and it's it's possible that's something we could expand yeah um, i know i've done this numerous times when starting a new event where i reach in and be like okay i want one of you 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 <laughs> just to try and get um having some sort of a preset would definitely be convenient the real question is sort of how much use that would get but like i guess more of that from a standpoint of is that a feature worth putting in but uh i mm -hmm. certainly would use it when i use yeah, it I, I, could, I could see that being useful for sure cool well let's put that in our back pocket mm -hmm. <laughs> i've already got some pipes back there so uh I'll have to put it in our backpack okay Let's move on to the next question. Uh, okay, next question here is from from last week from Siracas, uh, Siracas, uh, who asked, uh, when setting up background parties with champions that bring others in, uh, this would be, I guess, Mahan and uh, uh, DM, uh, they drop out of the party in some instances when playing on an active party. Is this a known issue? So yeah, so I asked Peter about this before the show, and it is a known issue, uh, specifically with DM. Um, there can be cases where champions that are supposed to be um, allowed to be in a, in a party that otherwise they wouldn't be allowed to be in, um, for some reason not having that having that rule, like I guess sort of momentarily not not active, uh, can sometimes cause those to be removed. Um, and we haven't tracked down exactly when and where that that can happen, but it sounds sounds like that it can. So we're aware of it, but we don't know the exact. Um, situation that's leading to it. So it is something we're still looking into. Uh, okay, that's all the questions from last week. Uh, the top question from this week, or the very first question from this week, we'll get right to that. Uh, it's from Garawar, uh, and they ask, uh, or they say, can you speak to the recent UI disappearance issues and the automated reset failures 
uh, that players have been seeing this week? Sure. So first one, uh, the recent the UI disappearance issues. Um, so there was uh, sort of the best way to start into this. So the, the way the game the game engine actually displays um, all of all of the graphical elements is it sorts them from from front to back or from back to front, I suppose, rather, and then it renders them in that order. And we're running in, the way we've got our setup in, in Unity, um, because Unity, of course, is a 3D engine and we're a 2D game, um, we create a bunch of uh, quads, which we put textures on, which is each of the, the individual graphic elements, and then we um, put them into a big hierarchy of, of connected uh, parent and child relationships that basically are the, the, um, the whole graphical display graph which I'm not sure that makes a, a whole lot of sense to everybody, but, um, and then we sort those and we assign them a value, uh, a Z index value um, inside of the space that we've got. And uh, sometimes they get, uh, we can end up in a situation where things have been assigned a value and then the parent was changed, like an, an item was reused and put somewhere else. Uh, and this results in, in the internal system that's tracking that, not necessarily, um, tracking it the way it was supposed to. There's a couple of bugs that were discovered in there um, when working on the new store stuff last week, uh, and uh, Mark uh, diligently went in and, and put in a fix for that particular issue, um, and I think in doing so caused a, a further issue that resulted in this UI disappearance that we saw, uh, which again was a sorting issue. It was an issue where things were getting uh, rendered in front of each other or behind each other when they should have been uh, rendered the other way around. Um, so that was causing the UI disappearance issue, uh, and it happened when you ended up with a, a large number of elements that had been uh, sorted and then resorted in the wrong place. So that, but that should be fixed at this point. Uh, the next question was the automatic automated reset failures players have been seeing this week. That one I don't have a lot of details into. I'm not 100% sure what was going on there. Um, we'd have to dig into that a little bit further. So, no details on that. Do you think that? Uh, yeah, well, I guess we, we're still looking into that one. We yeah. we have heard about it though. We're we're looking into it. I'd rather not. I guess not. <laughs> I did just randomly speculate on stream. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, um, but yeah, for sure we're looking into it. Um, but I don't, I don't have the details on that. Um, I think Peter's a little closer to that than I am. Um, I can pick his brain afterwards and see what, uh, what I'm able to share. Uh, next they're question. Making, they're making fun of you for saying Zed. We say Zed. Canadian, we're allowed to. We're Canadian. Most what? of the world says Zed. Oh, did I say the wrong one? No, you said Zed. That's oh. correct. Fair enough. I anyway. use them interchangeably. It upsets interchangeable group <laughs> someone is always upset um, can't make everyone happy <clears throat> no next question here is from Vovcast uh, question is uh, Krull is the most slow and annoying hero in the game <laughs> well, that's an opinion uh, always one enemy left on boss areas and cannot be killed can you make a feat for Krull so that enemies on boss areas slowly keep coming and area counts completed if boss killed also, he wouldn't be so slow if he would apply all three debuffs with uh, on hit, not just one at random. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I think this is an interesting kind of um, uh, design thing that kind of happens in the game. Uh, and there are some champions who uh, spike up really well when there are lots of enemies on the screen, and there are some champions that fall off very quickly when there are less enemies on the screen. And there's some that, uh, that do the reverse, that spike up um, when there are less enemies and uh, and go down when there are more. Um, and, uh, and it's just basically a design thing, right? Some champions work uh, well in, in situation X and some champions work well in situation Y. Um, so it's it's kind of by design that there are some that, that, that do one thing and some that do another. Now, with that said, um, we have been lately kind of trying to be more aware of each champion's abilities in sort of boss areas um, where you will get down to just one uh, one uh, creature left whether it's a boss or or a uh, or a trash mob um, and uh, and so we are trying to account for that in a lot of new champions abilities and anytime we're sort of um, reworking champions we try to account for that because we don't the, the situation where a champion falls off in a boss area is not an ideal one. It is a niche, um, but it's not a niche that we really want to fill um, anymore with, with new champions or with, uh, with reworked champions. So it is likely that when we get back to Kroll in the, in the great loop of balance, 
um, that uh, that some of his abilities may change in order to make him more effective when you when you get down to just a few enemies left, because uh, he definitely um, he powers up very quickly with a whole bunch of trash mobs when trash mobs are spawning over and over. But he definitely falls off when you get down to that last mob, and that is uh, yeah, that's just that's kind of the way he works right now. <clears throat> okay. Next question here from uh, Canelian. Why does Sentry lose her support buff ability when not in the front line? Seems like a weird choice when no other tank has that issue. Yeah. Um, I was looking at this ability lately because it was brought up uh, a couple of streams ago. And uh, it is a weird choice. Uh, I, I definitely agree with that. We don't have any other tanks that have that ability. Um, and I, I don't recall 100% exactly what I was thinking when we were designing Sentry the first time around. My intuition would say that we were looking for ways to encourage people to put the tank in the, or use the tank as a tank, um, which I think is an interesting kind of, um, of choice because a lot of tanks in the game well all tanks in the game essentially are also support champions i think the only exception to that would be a tank that is a, a tank dps like archon um so tank support uh is an interesting combination because they're basically doing two things all the time and they're doing two things um pretty well um in general if they're if they're a well-balanced uh tank support champion and I think it's an interesting kind of choice to have, say, a specialization on a tank that would make them more powerful uh, as a support if you're not using them as a tank, uh, or make them more powerful as a tank if you're using them as a tank. So there's a little bit of differentiation there. Um, but Sentry kind of has that uh, by accident um, based on whatever we were thinking uh, four years ago when we designed them. So I think that. Uh, you know that might be something that we'll look at if we if we get around to rebalancing Sentry, um, but uh, for now I think it's just it's kind of an interesting quirk of the the time, and uh, and I, I think it's yeah it's it's quite an interesting kind of design choice that we did back then. Uh, let's see here. The next question is here from uh, Gallistol. Uh, and they asked, or they say, uh, the Epic client shows item costs in the store in local currency. Uh, is it possible to get the Steam client to also display costs in the store in local currency instead of US dollars? Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm trying to remember what the limitations on the Steam store are for that. Do we not? This always trips me I up. I don't think we can get that for um, in-app purchases. So we can get that number for DLC, I think. So that's stuff that's available for purchase. Yeah, and certainly Steam when you client. click on it, when the Steam overlay pops up, it gives you your local currency. It will show you it in local currency, but I don't think we have the ability to do that for um, in-app purchases, or at least not without... Um, yeah, I'm not... I'm not yeah. I, I know we've <laughs> talked is... about... We've talked about this before, because I would love it. If, uh, if all of our stores could display uh, costs in local currency. Um, but I, there was some sort of limitation. I think uh, like Steam, it, they might rely on you to do the translation yourself, uh, which could result in some weirdness where if the, if the rates kind of fluctuate from day to day that one cost could be displayed in game and then Steam could generate a different cost when you actually click it. Yeah, um, I don't know. I know so this comes up every time. We've we've yeah. talked about this a few times internally, and I always forget which which clients had which or which APIs had which support. Um, and I know that for at least for the Steam in-app purchase uh, data, the actual showing up the price like Steam doesn't send us that data until we make a call to check with them or to send that the item details to them to show which then pops up and shows the client with the mm -hmm. Steam overlay. So. Yeah, I mean, should really have a, a clear answer on that. Um, unfortunately, it sounds like both of us forget the exact details of that one. Yeah, all all I know is I've I've asked about it, and uh, and uh, it's it's there's some there's some reason one of the one of the two cases either DLC or, or in-app purchases it doesn't uh, it doesn't natively kind of support it for us, uh, and we like to uh, it might require like some extra calls to Steam, which means it would stop working at 4 p.m. Uh, every day. <laughs> just randomly um, 
<laughs> so, yeah, uh, it's something I'd love to do if and, and it, if we circle back around uh, to it eventually and have a bunch of free time, it's something we can definitely try and get the team to look into again. But yeah, cool. Um, just going back up here, Dave. Question oh. two: Did you have any insight into this one here? Because if you don't, if you don't know what's going on there, and I won't bother um, asking it, but I'm just it. curious. Um, no, I didn't know it was doing that. Okay, <laughs> we, can, we can ask Peter about that, but we don't know anything about it, so we won't <laughs> we won't talk about it on stream. Uh, okay, so next question here uh, is from Cuddle Guts. Uh, and they ask an interesting question that's more of a kind of generic question with lots of answers. Uh, and they ask, what is the part of the game that you've worked on and are proudest of? You know, questions like this are always really difficult for me. Because um, <laughs> usually after I answer, you know, like 10 minutes later, I think of something else. Like, Man, that was actually way better. I should have said that. Is, um, <laughs> Well, you know, we'll, we will we will allow you to loop back to this question as many times you remember as you want later. over the next 40 minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I mean, most of the portions of the game that I've worked on have been, of course, uh, technical related. Um, I think probably the, like the first thing that comes to mind um, was the rework of the skeletal animation system. And that is mm -hmm. that, so um, if you're unfamiliar, uh, a lot of the characters in game are, are set up as, I, I think a, probably a good description of them would be kind of like paper dolls. Um, so um, all of the actual animation work is done, well, the characters are first drawn in Illustrator, and then the character is, and, and their piece, they're drawn in such a way that they, their pieces can be separated, you know, their arms, their torso, their head, um, legs, etc. It's often one of those funny things to do to walk past an artist's station and see like one leg missing and sort of standing there. <laughs> You're thinking, oh, what did you do to that poor character? Um, and they bring those all into Animate, um, pro formerly Adobe Flash, um, and they put all those pieces together into a, a, a character structure um, made out of little symbols, and then they actually animate those symbols um, by adding rotations and transforms onto the pieces to you know make them walk and attack and et cetera, et cetera. And then that is all, all of that uh, animation data is then processed by um, some scripts that we wrote that turn it into a, a sprite sheet, which, is a, which has a collection of all the little parts, all of the paper doll parts, um, and then a list of metadata, which is the, all of the positions that those all go in uh, to, to then recreate the animations that they did. And then game side, that is then reconstructed. All the parts are assembled into that structure, and then the positions are all played back to create the animations. And about, I don't know, maybe a year ago, 18 months ago, um, I ended up rewriting that whole system as an attempt to make the performance better on Switch, uh, such that on the client side, instead of uh, having you know a potentially a couple dozen different pieces that were um, being assembled to um, to make that character up, that all of that was pre-calculated and turned into one frame in advance, um, which increased the performance on that by like a hundred times, I think. <laughs> Now, it sounds like a lot from, like it didn't, over, the overall performance, of course, of the game was limited by lots and lots of other things, but this made the time that the, uh, the skeletal animations were taking move down from, say, you know, uh, taking up 15% of the processing time, going down to taking up like one and a half. Um, so I'm pretty proud of that. Mm -hmm. How about you? Well, I mean, I, I haven't done any of the kind of technical stuff. I really... The, as far as the front end goes, I don't I don't have my fingers in that too much. I've I've done some back end stuff, and uh, but that's you know, pr all pretty rote. Um, I think from a design perspective, uh, I really liked how the Modron cores uh, system worked out with the the pipe game. Uh, that was I think a really cool kind of addition to what otherwise might have been a pretty uh, boring kind of new feature that was just like automate your thing and go and and being able to add in that kind of mini game and that optimization piece um, I think was really cool because it, it really fit well with kind of the core thing you do in the game is you try and kind of optimize your formation and, and fiddle just to try and get a little bit more DPS uh, out and so I think that it uh, yeah it's really kind of it, it runs parallel to that kind of core game loop um, by trying to fiddle with your pipes and uh, and get the uh, and get the the most out of that, so yeah, that was uh, I think that was one of my favorite things that we've worked on. All right. Well, if either of us think of something else, we'll 
<laughs> yeah, we've got another <laughs> another 35 minutes or 30 uh, minutes or so. Okay, the next question here is from Yuda Baum. Um, I don't see natural time gate piece drops in the current loot log. Is that a bug or by design? Uh, that is a good question. I, I, I don't think it, it's definitely not by design. So if they're not showing up there, it may very well be a bug. Um, Sounds like I an know oversight. That, I think that sometimes they can, like if you see them drop out of a bag and then you don't see them in the log, then that's definitely a bug. Um, if you're just not seeing them drop kind of at all, um, that could be maybe some sort of, uh, well, it would also be a bug, but it could also be some sort of um, side effect of like offline progress if they're like dropping in a background party or something like that and then just not uh, not showing up there. But yeah, they uh, we can we can look into whether or not they should be showing up in the in the loot log in the uh, in the journal history bit thing there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, like, that sounds to me like an oversight, so it wouldn't be too difficult to get it in there if it's missing. Mm -hmm. Next question so, from... Like uh, what's the name? Idiot Controls Someday. Or Idiot Controls Someday. Okay. Huh? Each to their own. Uh, Everyone needs a username. Let's not judge. <laughs> <laughs> now that the item level cap refund is implemented, Will it be possible to fill in the gaps in our collections for anything we may have missed before hitting the item level cap? Yeah, this is a good question. We kind of talked about this uh, last episode or the episode one of the one of the episodes last week. I know we talked about this, and um, I think that the item level capped refund probably won't affect um, filling in slots. So, so the the example here is if you've got um, you know an say an ultimate cooldown item that uh, that is capped out and you've got that capped but you haven't yet gotten the common or, or uncommon or rare item for it um, because you are at the cap uh, those items would never drop in a chest because we don't want to give you an item that gives you literally no benefit um, so we kind of talked about maybe some other ways of filling in those gaps um, some other like a very specific type of chest that you'd have to uh, seek out and, and purchase uh, very intentionally in order to uh, to have those uh, extra items drop, um, because they wouldn't necessarily be something we'd want everyone to get, um, because not everyone would find value in those, because not everyone wants to fill out their collection or cares about that. But uh, I understand, you guys. <laughs> I want everything to be filled in as well, uh, and so yeah, that's definitely something that uh, we're we're going to try and find a way to do uh, down the road. Yeah, I mean, I maybe I'm off base here, but. I think the number of cards that are often missing, which is like one or two, would probably not be a huge deal to most people if they, you know, ended up with one at one point and it wasn't, you know, okay, you didn't, you didn't quite get uh, something that was super useful in that particular pass. As long as there's something useful in the chest, I mean, I think that's kind of been sort of always our, our mo with with regard to chests is that you know we guarantee a certain like you know an upgrade. Um, and, and that can be one of the cards and then everything else could be filling in your collection <laughs> and it wouldn't be long as long as we didn't let you repeatedly collect those ones again um, it probably I'm saying it probably wouldn't hurt to allow those to appear just for collections purposes but um, yeah on the other hand I'm, I'm really gonna get the uh, as soon as we do that we're gonna get a question <laughs> in the next stream we do of like I got a useless item can you please stop these from dropping well we'll just refer you to the people who are asking about <laughs> the other thing you guys can fight it out um <clears throat> yeah uh yeah definitely definitely something that we want to address at some point whether we kind of do it the way that dave was describing or the way that i was describing is uh is still very much up in the air actually i don't just i mean you noticed in the chat there that uh Ema mentions that it wouldn't be bad now because the cap refund would just refund them so you that just you actually just get, just get back a blacksmith contract the next time you load the game yeah that's true see nothing lost perfect <laughs> We've got a solution. You just have to explain that to people. Be like, hey, why do I like open? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, let's move on from that question. It's assuming they're taking very careful balance of everything they got <laughs> at that point. I think we'll be okay. Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead. Next question. Uh, next question from Longtime Lurker. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this, actually. What are your thoughts on allowing the use of pipe component pieces, uh, Modron component pieces, to reroll the directions of directed pipes? I mean, that doesn't sound like a terrible idea to me. 
Um, <laughs> although like re-rolling the direction, is, is it really re-rolling the direction or is it just switching the direction? Because I think most, in most cases, mm, are there no, more than two options for this? Yes, yes, yes. In, in most cases? Most cases yes, or just in, in cases some cases? Are. The only cases where, where just swapping the direction makes sense is in, in like straight or turf pipes. But those right, aren't all the corner pipes, pieces. Those aren't the pipes they care about. It's the ones with multiple inputs and one output are the ones that they want to be able to oh, Okay. Yeah. And those are the ones that like for the four way, those are the ones you can only get in, uh, in chests, right? You can't upgrade to those because there's no four way directed in rare or lower. I mean, I think it wouldn't be a bad idea provided the amount of, of pipe component pieces you use is, is balanced properly. I certainly wouldn't want it just to be a freebie to switch the direction to, of the mm -hmm. pipes, but also it wouldn't want it to make it so that it was prohibitively uh, cons or consuming your component pieces uh, too aggressively. But, um, yeah. The <laughs> Ouch, wondering where I just, just burn me hardcore in chat. Okay. We'll get to that later. Um, <laughs> so I think the, yeah, the, the important thing here um, is that the sort of getting the directed pipes, especially those four ways with three inputs and one output, that is uh, absolutely like the end game of Mo the Modron sort of uh, pipe system mini game. And so we would want to make sure that this system was balanced such that um, it doesn't trivialize that end game or make that end game too much uh, kind of easier uh, than it is because we want that to be able to to last for for a while. We don't want you to just be able to kind of uh, disenchant or you know, disassemble a whole bunch of pieces and then just be able to get exactly what pieces you want. So, you know, I think there's there is probably a point there at which it's balanced, um, but we we want to be very careful about that. Okay, here's the next question, which I think interestingly enough. And we'll see what it is the question. I was looking at the chat. I saw a Foolish Genius asking, is my question still on the floor? And I think it's literally the next question here, mm -hmm. unless you had more than one. Uh, but question here from Foolish Genius, and they ask, do you have information regarding the nature of the compensation stated uh, with regards to the Switch users who are not able to participate in Dragon Down? Uh, I do not have any information on that yet. Um, I think we were, we're trying to get a build through Lockcheck that supports Merylwin. And uh, there are some issues with that. I know Peter uh, is normally out of the, or works from home today, but has come in to try and address uh, yet another uh, issue that came back from, from Nintendo. So we are trying to get that built through. We're, we're trying to get it through as quickly as we can. Um, I, I believe the last stuff I saw said that we would reevaluate tomorrow. Uh, and let players know what the plan was uh, with regards to it uh, tomorrow. So um, I, I think if it's anything kind of like what we've done in the past, I know we've done where we've just, we'll just give away like the, uh, or we'll, two Switch users will give them the champion as well as some chests. Um, but uh, it might be, it might be different this time. You know, there might be a, a way to, uh, to extend the event or something like that, just on Switch. I'm I'm not 100% sure what the plan is because that is uh, that is happening at a, a different level from from me. Yeah, and it still sounds like it's in flux. So it is very much in flux. Look, yes. it's your favorite time, Justin. Oh boy, okay, everyone, get ready. Uh, we're about to start the ye olde giveaway. Uh, you guys know the drill if you've been here before. Uh, you type a keyword into chat once it says that the giveaway has started and you have an opportunity to win 42 chests of your choice. In fact, it's now, the giveaway has started. Uh, type the keyword into chat, uh, all one word. Uh, you can just copy and paste it from the message there from CNE Games. Uh, and you will have a chance to win 42 chests of uh, your choice. That could be any type of chest. Even uh, silver chests? It could be silver chests if you hate loot. Uh, it could be silver chests. That'll give you the least amount of stuff. Uh, if you like loot, you could go for gold chests. You could choose a patron chess if you really want to gear up all your strawed uh, champions. You could get a strawed patron chest. Uh, you could get a Modron component chest. That would be my preferred type of chest because I just love Modron components um, and pipes. Uh, as has been made clear by the questions and answers in this thing. Uh, so yeah, you can uh, choose any sort of type of uh, uh, chest and uh, 
and and if you if if you win it, you will you'll get forty two of those. So that'll be exciting, uh, and that that will last for just a couple more uh, minutes. So type it in. Yep. And, you know, I think you're wrong, Justin. It's not for people who hate loot. It's for people who want to play the game on hard mode. And since ah. you keep making those Dark Souls comparison, that just seems like <laughs> exactly what that type of player would want to do. So, you know, if you if you want to play the game on hard mode, just don't type in the keyword and then you won't have a chance to win 42 chests of your choice. You could win them and then not use them. That's true. You I have mean, them there are many in case options of emergency. Here. There are many options where you don't need to choose silver chests. <laughs> Okay. okay, I think we can move on. Let us do that. Uh, the next question here is from uh, TG Nubus, uh, who says, in a previous Dev Insight, I requested a shuffle button on the jukebox player. Is that still a possibility? And Mars also asks for a mini player so it doesn't take up half the screen, please. Fair enough. Okay, so first part of that question, or I guess the question asked by TG Nubus, uh, yeah, I mean, a shuffle button sounds like a great thing to have. I don't know why we didn't get that in. I'm going to highlight it, and I will bring it up again with Peter. Um, and then, yes, Mars asking a mini player so it doesn't take up half the screen. That's a good question. That one might have to take a look at and see if it's possible. Um, I don't make the fonts too small, but I guess you could make one that didn't have the, the actual Just have a minimize of, button. Yeah, just, yeah, the just minimize. doesn't have the list. You know, like, yeah. uh, like Winamp. Back it really in the day. whoops the llamas at. You just, um, you just close the the uh, the playlist section. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. You know, I bet if I uh, sent that over to Jarrett, uh, to Jarrett, he'd enjoy making some updates to his jukebox. <laughs> that was a uh, Jarrett's baby. No, Jarrett is busy putting in champions before the game jam. Is that what he's doing? I don't know. I think he's making a mini jukebox with a shuffle button. Right? Oh dear. Okay. Well, okay. If anyone is curious as to why features didn't get out on time. <laughs> These are features. We're These are quality of life box. features. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, next question here uh, is from Wandering Bereft, although I don't know if you're going to answer it now that uh, he uh, or they gave you such <laughs> a hard time. They burned me about the, about the strong core. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, will, I will put in that extra node when I feel like it, which is <laughs> going to be when I remember when I'm not sitting here uh, on Dev Insights. All right, well, let's see if you want to answer the question anyway. The question is, following on from last week and long bows, mm. Marilyn has a bow. Yay, but you don't let Yay. her attack with it. Boo. Oh. <laughs> Justin, please explain again why you hate archers. Uh, I, I don't hate archers. Um, people who play D&D hate archers. I don't know. Um, so uh, my understanding of this, uh, and I believe there was an interview right before this show, uh, is that the content creator for Marilyn uh, specifically requested either a different attack or or something like that? So um, yeah, it wasn't. If it was up to me, Marilyn would have attacked with a, with a bow. But uh, you know, we got to do what the the owner of the character wants to do. Right. So, so it's not know. Justin who hates archers. It's uh, <laughs> it's the content creator. She it's, hates it's archers. Marilyn herself. Yes. Uh, no, I like it. OG17 says arrows are expensive. That's true. You know what? They, they don't <laughs> grow on economy, trees. You can't, just, you can't just get an arrow tree. Uh, yeah. yeah. With, with inflation gas prices and everything. the way they are. Oh my gosh, arrow yeah. deliveries. Arrow deliveries are just, they've doubled in price. The, the Faerun equivalent of Amazon is pumping up those prices. Much easier to just, you know, use a spell or something that uh, doesn't cost anything. Something renewable. Mana is renewable. It's the green energy. I feel like you could fetch the arrows and reuse them, though. <laughs> don't don't bring logic into this. Okay. <laughs> this is not a discussion for logic. Next question. Uh, let's see. Okay. The next question is from uh, Fewer Pills, uh, who asks, uh, can we have a way to use more than one potion of a kind of a rarity uh, with Modron Automation? Especially for the white ones, it would be super helpful. Currently, it is sadly not possible. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is a limitation that has come back to haunt me just from mm -hmm. the amount of questions that we had about it, not <laughs> from the original implementation. I know we looked at that and we're like, we'll fix that. But we need to get this out, so we're doing it like this for now. Mm -hmm. um, because that I was a... I wonder if it's something where the, uh, the sort of the earlier suggestion about potion presets could be maybe merged into this. So instead of, you know, setting up 
uh, the motor animation to just kind of use a potion, this potion at this area kind of thing. If instead you could kind of set up, use this preset at this area and then have a way to set up those presets and you can trigger those separately for motor animation, but Modron actually just functions through those presets. I'm moving my hands around a lot for this, I'm noticing, but you know, that could be a, a potential way to kind of uh, kill two birds with one stone there. I mean, it would certainly help. The concern would be if it had to be sort of a more complicated setup of the preset. And I think some of them, like the way it's set up right now, you get to use one potion at what? one level do you get to specify that again after like can you run it again at a different level i don't think so I don't right i think so no i think no. You, you pick the potion type and you pick the level yeah, yeah i think, it I think, I think it's already i think it's already quite convoluted uh, <laughs> in yes. terms of, of setting that yes. up so I, I don't necessarily know that you know having it uh use a certain preset at a certain level would be more convoluted especially if the preset stuff like the potion usage preset stuff was something you set up outside of motor animation so you're already kind of familiar with it by the time yeah. you get there. i mean it isn't like you have to first find a book about it and then you have to go gather all the all of the ingredients and then you have to meditate on it for <laughs> well if you wish to bake an apple pie you must first create the universe. i was just thinking of the original witcher with the <laughs> See, um, i didn't play the witcher one well it was pretty complicated to have to make potions um Anyway, that's kind of a digression. I do think that should be fixed. I think that should be, I think we should be allowed, I, I think it should have just a list of ones you can use at, at various levels and be allowed to have multiples. It was just something that was, uh, I know it was a limitation at the time. If I remember correctly, it was, we were on a time crunch for that and the developer who was working on it, who was a co-op student, um, I, I think he'd had a bit of a hard time with that just in general when we got it through and I thought, we're just going to leave this for now, and, and we'll get to it after. So, we didn't, and I'm just going to tag that. Let's see if I can try and remember to get that looked at. <clears throat> okay, that's good. Next question uh, from Jamic Unyielding: What is the hardest part of choosing or scheduling which champions come out in each event? Uh, so it's actually quite easy for me because uh, I just have Dupuy do it. Um, <laughs> but I know that he really struggles with this. Um, I think that there are a lot more factors, especially now, that go into uh, picking which champions are in each event than there really ever has been before. Um, you know, certainly there's some champions that line up with live, uh, live table play. So for example, when we do uh, Idle Champion Presents and we do new champions uh, that we kind of present in there, we have to make sure that those champions come out during their events. Um, we like to try and make sure that content creator champions come out at a point when the content creator is around and can uh, uh, can chat about them and can can help us uh, hype them up. And so that often uh, influences who gets uh, who gets out when. Uh, if we do champions that are associated with certain uh, wizards releases. Uh, so like a new campaign or something like that, or, or new um, errata or, or new books. Uh, we need to make sure those are around that time. So I think it's, uh, I think it's, really, uh, it's really quite challenging to, to, um, to juggle all of those different concerns and, and figure out what, who goes when. But we are also, the, the other thing is we're also trying to do it much further ahead of time than we've ever tried to do it before. So I think we've already kind of planned through uh, March of next year in terms of who the champions are. Uh, but then, of course, we start working on that and, and things can change because, you know, uh, things can change in, in nine months. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's a very, very complex thing and there's just so many factors. I think the hardest thing is just how many different factors there are uh, when it comes to which champions make the most sense in which event slots. So it's, it's, just, uh, it's just incredibly complex. We've made it incredibly complex. It used to be easy. We just go, this champion is the next one we're going to work on. So now it's like, wait, we have to have stuff done months ahead of time? Grr. Uh, let's see, next question here is from Hypnotic Sheep. Bah. Uh, any ETA on the new shop filters being re-added? They were nice while we had them. We took them away? Yeah, that was my thought question. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that it happened, but um, I will check in with Jacob and see what happened there. But I know we added some new shop filters and I did not know they had been pulled. Oh. So that sounds like a mistake. That's oh, like I'm a getting mistake. a follow up here. Oh, okay. We're getting 
in, in real Mysterious. time it's been typed in. Mysterious gods are, are writing in our document. From what Mars understands, Ooh. the race and class filters were added, but were not localized. Yet. Oh, oh, so they were, oh, I see. So they went out. Oh, I see. We didn't have the proper localizations for them, so they got pulled. Okay, so as soon as we get those localized, I assume they will pop back in. There's, right. a, there's another thing that makes uh, champion scheduling harder is just uh, everything has to be localized now. Yeah, that is definitely another wrench in the system. Just adds so much time to everything. All right. Yeah. Uh, next question. Um, actually, before we get to the next question, I just comment here because we see a question here uh, in between here from Cassius335 asking if we watched the Summer Games Fest, which we did not. At least I did not. I don't know if you caught any of that, Justin. I did not. I did not yeah. catch any of it. No. So unfortunately, no a, comments on that. I'm a bad gamer. <laughs> 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 I, have a, I have a young daughter now and I just I, oh my it's gosh, hard to I find time for everything time. Yeah. except that apparently you do have to play all three Witcher 3 or all three Witcher games according to uh, someone back here in the chat that I, yeah that I is, will I will add that to my list of yes, things Ghostwalker says you have to do that it's a life requirement <laughs> um, well I'm going to have a lot of life after, uh, <laughs> after I'm done raising these kids you can get them uh, to play and you can watch oh that's a great idea I can just be that annoying. I can be like the annoying younger brother, but for my own children. <laughs> like, go there, go there. Kill the monkey. Ah. Right. Next question, though, is from Lightning Hawk asking, is there a reason why we cannot have more than one of the same familiar? After all, if we could have 27 mage hands, we could have a hand on everything or a dragon or a phoenix or whatever familiar we want to get multiples of. Um, yeah, I... What? Are, yeah, there's just you can just have one of each. No, there's no real reason for it. It's just the way it is. <laughs> well, I mean, there is a reason, and certainly that reason from a just a, um, a a game standpoint, from us being able to uh, to balance and monetize features in the game, because we have to. After all, we have to pay for the game. Well, yes, and, that's, uh, that's familiars true. are a, um, something that are a super valuable item for players and. Uh, we try to balance how many of those that we, we give to players as something you can earn in the game. And then we have some that come from wild offers or from other uh, purchasable uh, methods which support the game, which of course make it possible. And uh, allowing um, multiples of the of the same familiar does kind of defeat that, unfortunately. Um, and so, so we do kind of keep a rein on how many familiars are available in that regard. Um, and certainly, yeah, we get out of hand not very quickly if you get out multiples, but. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. If you could buy as many uh, mage hands as you wanted for you know, what 250 gems each, uh, it would definitely uh, tank the economy for familiars. Yeah. So part of that's definitely a business decision. Yeah. But we also don't let you repurchase the the paid ones either. So you know it's not uh, it's not just about. That. Yeah. Yeah. It's got impacts on many levels. <laughs> we keep a yeah. tight mage hand on that. Uh, I, nah, I tried. Anyway, <laughs> next question is from Hufik, asking, any plans Ooh. for changing Okora's passive Defender of Waterdeep? It's passive not working at 80% of adventure. Uh, I think they mean it's not, it doesn't work in 80% of the adventures. Oh, um, oh my bad. <clears throat> I should have <laughs> fixed the, the time. But yes, uh, so Okora's uh, Defender of Waterdeep allows you, or it, it basically just buffs uh, all of your adventures in the Waterdeep campaign. Uh, or potentially also uh, adventures that start in Waterdeep. So I'm not sure uh, that that works 100% of the time. But anyway, the uh, yeah, the idea with that is it's it's not really designed to to work everywhere. Um, it's it's very intentionally just designed to give you a little bit of a boost if you use Olcoria uh, in the Waterdeep campaign or in uh, any of the adventures that start in Waterdeep because you unlock Olcoria through the Waterdeep campaign uh, and uh, she lives in Waterdeep and, and spends a lot of time there. So it's it's more flavor that is just a slight benefit um, when you're in those adventures uh, and not really intended to be something that kind of works in the in the wider game. I think it's it's yeah it's definitely more flavor than uh, than something we intend to be a core part of her kit. Okay. Uh, this this next question here, do you know <laughs> what it's asking? Uh I did not highlight this one because I was not sure what it was asking. It feels like it might have been run through a translator. Yeah. I mean, we can certainly read it and, and see if anyone knows what, what they're asking. 
Um, I, I th actually, okay. Let me let me let me restate that. I think it's asking for a pause feature. <laughs> so I uh, I'll just read the question out. It's from uh, I am Samoth or Samoth, uh, and they say I am not fully confident that the abrupt execution of this program may lead to equipment damage, and in addition, real life happens. Is some sort of pause feature ever intended? Uh, if only when the program starts. Uh, so I, I think it's just asking for a pause feature in the game. <laughs> Though the, the, the wording is confusing, uh, but I just may not be on, uh, on whatever level. Well, I mean, if the question is around, uh, is a pause feature ever, in, uh, would we be considering a pause feature? Generally speaking, the answer is, is no, um, because the game itself, uh, there's really no, no cause to actually have to pause the game. Um, so the, the questions around that, I think, uh, if, if I'm interpreting this correctly, is the concern that, um, you know, you, can, you could lose. Um, you know, your characters can die, um, but uh, once you sort of get used to the nature of the game, which is you just get bumped back a level, um, and then things carry on, um, there's actually not, not any cost to, uh, to losing at an area. Um, so if... Uh, so I, I think that was kind of the, the, the first part of that question was the worry that, that um, if you're not paying attention or if you, if you um, let, it, let the characters get into trouble, um, that, that that's a problem for your, for your adventure. But it, it's actually not. Um, and if you just go back a few areas and if you're looking to you know, reconfigure your formation, and now that is something uh, that has come mm -hmm. up on numerous occasions, something that we've discussed lots of times and would like to have a better way to actually sort of arrange your formation. Um, but we have never come up with a, a solution right now that we've been comfortable putting into place beyond like the uh, the complicated formation builder feature that did get designed and didn't get implemented. Um, so yeah, so I guess the idea here is that we're not likely at this point to be adding a pause feature, um, but I wouldn't say we would never do such a thing, um, mm -hmm. but from the issues or concerns raised, um, those are actually not something that you need to worry too much about. I hope that makes sense and that we interpreted the question correctly. Yeah, there, there are some, uh, just reading through the chat as that went on, there are uh, a couple of people who are asking us to not pause the game while the chest or shop is open. Um, un unfortunately, that's something where uh, we, we really kind of need to do that, uh, especially for the shop, um, just because of the, the complexity. It actually causes uh, a lot of slowdown. One of the issues we had with the shop, with shop three, especially initially was uh, it wasn't pausing the game um, when the shop was open, and that actually caused a lot of issues on uh, uh, with the responsiveness of the shop on console. So uh, that's something that we really kind of need to do when there's more complex dialogues open. Uh, it's probably part of the reason Modron, the Modron core um, thing, runs a little runs poorly on some platforms as well. Yeah, and that was a more complex in and of itself. Just sort of following the chat here, I do see uh, the uh, the player who asked that question saying that they're thinking that no program should be running out of the box. I guess they're more asking about just the uh, the fact that there's no main menu as well, right? Like the game just mm -hmm. drops you off um, right where you left off, um, which is uh, ag again sort of a carryover. We, we talked about this last week. I think that yeah, I think uh, there's no. That the campaign map isn't the default screen, the game screen isn't the default screen. It's just wherever you were, that's where you resume. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's a problem. I don't think. I think this is uh, maybe sort of a difference of opinion of how the the, the game should should start and run. But um, it, it, the game just it drops you off where you left, um, and if you open, you open it. You know that's that's where it's going to take you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. We've got a few minutes left. I can certainly ask these next uh, couple of questions. Uh, so this is this one might might take a while, might not take a while. Who knows? From uh, Remus Two, uh, they ask kind of a technical question: How do you like using Unity? Um, Unity being the engine that the the game kind of runs in. Uh, I've done a little work with it and find it interesting, but haven't had a lot of experience in it yet. Yeah, well, I don't know how technical this is. Sort of a how do you like? You know, it's a, I like it. <laughs> it's a, um, so we've been using Unity for some time. Um, well, obviously for all of Champions, but actually um, our first product that we released with Unity was the mobile version of Crusaders that we did, which actually served as kind of the, the jumping off point, the, uh, the base code for what we, we started for Champions. Um, and the, kind of the interesting thing about, uh, about that is that 
because we were 2D, uh, and Unity, of course, is 3D, and Unity's 2D features have matured quite a bit at this point, but when we started, they didn't have um, pretty much any 2D features to speak of. And so we ended up uh, writing our own 2D platform on top of it, and then we used Unity uh, largely as a as a platform, like a build platform, because it it builds to so many different um, different platforms. You know, like because we're on um, you know iOS, Android, PC, Mac, um, Xbox, PlayStation, etc. And Unity supports building to all those platforms, which is just amazing. It's made our lives significantly easier uh, because we haven't had to maintain different versions of the game for those platforms. That would be the only sort of alternative way to do it. Um, so for that, it's been awesome. But in terms of like actually using Unity's Unity features, um, that's something that we have less experience with, although certainly I've done a number of you know side projects and my own stuff using Unity. And I would, I mean, I think it's quite quite well put together like I would definitely recommend it uh, to anyone who wants to you know get into uh, into game development yeah mm -hmm. easy to learn and tons of tutorials online so yeah I think that's probably the biggest the biggest thing that makes it really uh, good to get into is just the sheer number of like tutorials and, and people who are using it online because it uh, it doesn't if you're like hey how do I do this thing uh, you can probably find someone who's gonna talk to you on YouTube for 60 minutes about how to do that <laughs> thing uh, and you will be an expert in it by the time you are done. So uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, very, and if you want a different, <laughs> if you want a difference of opinion or a, a different opinion, you can search for another video, and they'll tell you another another approach. <laughs> um, and yeah. there's often like tons of responses in the forums too for stuff like that. So lots and lots of uh, activity around it. So I think it's mm -hmm. a, probably a great platform for learning um, if, you're, if you're getting into game development. So yeah, absolutely, definitely recommend it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's one other sort of thing that's popping up in chat here from uh, from Garo with regards to the pausing thing. Uh, and he's bringing up the point that there are some variants where uh, champions get pulled out at certain thresholds due to the, the variant rules, and you have to rebuild your formation very, very quickly uh, in order to not fall back. And if you fall back, then you get swapped around to the champions that were available for. That is true. There are so definitely some some edge cases um, that can can could certainly use some sort of pause feature. Um, I'm just not sure if those edge cases make it uh, a worthwhile investment of, of tech time uh, to do that type of thing because they are they are very much sort of niche cases. There's, there's probably less than a than a half dozen of those kind of uh, variants where they uh, really uh, can can uh, can mess you up like that. All right. What do you think? Do you want to do one more question, or are we? Uh, uh, looks like we are we could... two minutes to the hour. Let's let's answer the last one here for uh, also from I am Samoth, and then we can move on. Or sure, yeah, and we'll follow up with the next one that we've got below sure. there uh, next episode. So yeah, another question here from uh, I am Samoth, who says most of the uh, UI elements have a cursor blurred bl cursor bleed through. Uh, will that type of polish be addressed? Um, so I mean, I'm certainly. Uh, I think I know what you're saying. You're talking about uh, cases where um, the mouse, when you're hovering over one item, will still will show a hover underneath uh, for certain certain elements. Now, I think it's kind of the other way around. I think most of the UI elements do not have bleed through, but there are a few specific cases where global regions are being tracked um, for, for bleed through, um, and those are a little bit trickier to, to sort of handle that particular case. Um, like I said, I think it's the other way around. I think most don't have bleed through. Some do, and for the cases that do, um, you can't actually, you know, click on the items from below them. There'd be some like, oh, it's being hovered, but you can't actually click through to it. Um, and so that's not something that uh, that's sort of top of list, uh, given a lot of the other uh, sort of features and, and bug lists that, that we're tackling. So um, mm -hmm. not a priority item. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay, uh, so yeah, looks like that's all we've got time for. If we didn't get to your question this week, don't worry, you'll have another opportunity. We will be live again. No, we won't be live again at the same time next week. We'll be live again at this same time in two weeks. Uh, we are taking next week uh, as a company to do a, a company-wide uh, kind of game jam. So that should be lots of fun for us. And uh, you guys won't get to ask us questions. 
uh, which will be less fun for us, but we'll have fun doing the game jam. So, you know, <laughs> uh, before we sign off, though, we'd like to thank our Tyler's mods this week. It was Mars and Martin. They're the ones who copy your questions into our questions doc and generally make things awesome in chat. So thanks, guys. And of course, thanks to all of you for hanging out, watching the stream, asking such great questions and enjoying the game, because without you, nobody here would get to do what we do. Uh, yes, we have to do something else. What, tracks? All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. I have to scroll back up in chat and figure out what this obsession is with rope. I think they're supposed to have 30 feet of rope in your backpack. 50 feet of... 50 of, feet. 50 feet of rope. rope. It's a default D&D character item. I know that. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff, actually. Uh, we better stop. We're going to hit 301. We should implement it all. <laughs>